This is Mick Foley, the hardcore legend, and this is InYourHeadOnline.com. All right, and we are back here at In Your Head Wrestling Radio. I am the internet icon, the pride of the pilgrims, the nature boy, handsome Jackie Jones, along with my right-hand man and the enforcer of the Headyverse. One Inch Biceps, the power goat. Ah, how about that, Jack? How about that? I am very impressed. You're bringing your A game tonight. <laughs> He's joining us right off the bat here. Well, we're 12 minutes late, but it's right off the bat of the show. We have Rusty Brooks with us. How are you doing, sir? Oh, hanging in there. Doing real good. How are you guys doing? Excellent. Hmm, yep, doing pretty good myself. Excellent, excellent. So I'm very happy to have you on here. A uh, lot of time wrestling fan, and, and I've seen uh, lots of your career. And I um, always like to ask, uh, were you a wrestling fan growing up, and uh, how did you uh, break into the business? Oh, definitely. Uh, my dad and I, uh, one of the things we did together was watch wrestling. And uh, I broke into the business down here in Florida. Um, actually, it's kind of a funny story. Uh, I was reading the newspaper, uh, uh, not ad, but an article, and the old Miami Herald was talking about a grandfather getting his kicks in wrestling. And when I looked him up, it turned out he only lived about 10 minutes from me. So I went by there, and uh, he helped train me and get me started in wrestling. Uh, he also started Ricky Santana in wrestling. So it was interesting, you know, the way to get started, but uh, that was about it. He, he, was, uh, he was a grandfather, like uh was he uh, anybody that, that you had known before? Or? Well, no. He, he Actually, he had been, uh, in the old days, they called him outlaw wrestling in the Carolinas uh, long before the independence uh, when it was kind of frowned on. But uh, that's as far as he ever got. Mm-hmm. He had worked some shows in Carolinas, and then he moved down here. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was involved in training down here. But uh, that's about it. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, you were a wrestling fan, and you, you, you found this guy. And, uh, did he uh, did he have to smarten you up, or were you kind of, uh, you know, how smart were you about the wrestling business when you went into to train to become a wrestler? Not very much. I mean, you know, back then it was so secretive, and I mean, uh, you know, most of the fans back then were believers, <laughs> and uh, I was no different. So, yeah, but he did a good job of smartening us up and teaching us what we needed to know. Mm-hmm. Did he, uh, you know, because a lot of guys have kind of horror stories about breaking the wrestling and, you know, they would get stretched. And uh, uh, did he do anything like that to you, or was he a pretty good guy? No, he was a real good guy. And, and I mean, you know, I was very fortunate. And, and I've heard a lot of the horror stories and seen a few. So I know what you're talking about. Um, this guy was, uh, uh, his name was Jim Eisler. And uh, he had, uh, when I first started wrestling, when I first broke in, he wound up being my manager on some uh, outlaw or independent shows down here in Florida. Mm-hmm. But that uh, was a very good guy. He broke us in the right way. I mean, he showed us all the basics and, um, you know, never never stretched anybody. But uh, he would have been capable of he was a, He was a tough old guy. Mm-hmm. In that era of wrestling, we talked about having, like, uh, you know, the territories and then the outlaw territories. Um, you know, as a wrestler, how different is that, would you say, than compared today with uh, – with the independent scene? Like, uh, was it easier to, to find a place to work once you're trained? And could you make, like, decent money where you went out well, to a job? Yeah, you know, it's funny. The money was okay. And, and I mean, it, actually, uh, getting work was a lot harder because the, the regular promotions, like down here with Florida Championship Wrestling, they frowned on that, and they would do pretty much anything in their power to get rid of the outlaws, you know. It's not like today where anyone that can get a ring can run a show. Mm-hmm. Do you think then, for that kind of reason, you kind of uh, you had to be you had to stand out more to to actually you know work uh, on a territory? Oh yeah, no doubt. And and I mean, the, uh, I was fortunate that um, at the time I broke in, um, we did a couple of independent shows down here or outlaw shows down here that had some pretty good crowds to them. And then later on, we were uh, able to get affiliated with the great Malenko, mm-hmm. who, was running, who was running outlaw shows in Tampa in opposition to Eddie Graham. What was uh, what was Bob Boris like, uh, the, the great Malenko? 
you know, it's, you know, he was a hell of a nice guy and, and one, of the, one of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. And uh, if you later figured out, you know, or I got a chance to know him, he was totally different from his character. Mm-hmm. Because when I, when I grew up, the great Malenko was the big heel here in Florida. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it was um, <laughs> it was kind of interesting for a young kid to go out there and finally get to meet the guy that he used to hate, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then find out that he was a good guy after all. Uh-huh. Now, um, what would you say, like, uh, you, you would have learned uh, f- from Boris? Well, I mean, uh, Jim Eister originally trained me, and then when, when I met Boris, he had just expanded his Tampa school down here to Fort Lauderdale. So uh, living in the area, we were able to work out with him, and he really showed us a lot more, you could say, polished up in, you know, our career and, and taught us a lot of wrestling. A lot of psychology, um, you know, how to how to do things, how to protect yourself, how to protect your opponent. You know, I mean, it was a tremendous learning experience being able to work with him. Yeah, when you say he was, a, you know, a big villain, a uh, big heel, uh, for some um, fans who who know, you know, Dean Malenko stuff might not know the great Malenko. He was also like an e- his character was like an evil German guy, right? Kind of like- uh, Russian, Russian, Russian. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. And I mean, I tell you, you know, a funny story, and, and I mean, not to uh, to show you how uh, over he was as a heel here in Florida. Even when I broke in, and, and later on when he came down from the south here to help us out and work his school, I introduced him to my father. And my father, you know, even though he knew, and I explained to him what wrestling was all about, when Malenko came in the house, he was sitting in his chair with his fists balled up. Because <laughs> he still hated Malenko. And that's how over Malenko was as a bad guy here in South Florida. Yeah. Now, did you, uh, when did you meet like his kids, Dean and Joe? Uh, a couple of years uh, into my career, when I first went out to Tampa, Malenko had an outlaw promotion that was running television in the Tampa, um, and just kind of adjoining areas in Tampa. And uh, he was uh, he was the main event, and his two sons, of course, were, were the top guys for that outlaw promotion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. Um, it's actually. Um, I wasn't familiar with this until uh, until we got you on the show, and then I was watching it, and they had. I think it was Global Wrestling, and um, they had, it's all up on YouTube for people listening to the show, and it's a great. Um, it, it's it's you got you were like the tag champs. When you were managed by Boris Malenko, and you guys are wrestling uh, Dean and Joe Malenko, and uh, they show the, the whole uh, the whole angle and the progression of it. And uh, for people who aren't aware of that, would you just like to uh, explain how how that went? Well, when we first started Global, uh, the, the Malenkos were going to be a heel tag team with their father. Mm-hmm. And then, as we started to get into the production, they changed it over and made the two boys baby faces. And originally, the father managed Jumbo Beretta and myself. And it eventually evolved into a situation where Ox Baker became involved, and then Ox would manage us, and the great Malika would manage his sons. And uh, that's where it wound up. Yeah. This is a great angle. And uh, uh, Ox Baker, uh, Intra and I, it's one of our favorite guests. We had on the first year we did the show, 2005, and he was voted uh, favorite uh, interview of the year, and we had him on you know, several times since then. And uh, what was he like to be around? Because we've been around him a little bit, but uh, he's, in my opinion, just a great wrestling character and a great guy. Uh, he was a tremendous character, and he was a fun guy to be around. I mean, he had great stories, and I mean, he was always in character, and, and he, he could keep you laughing. He could scare the crap out of you, but uh, Lax was a special person. Yeah. So um, how did you end up uh, going to the WWF? Well, it was funny because when I first started working down here on the independent school, well, I keep saying independent, but it was outlaw wrestling down here. Mm-hmm. It was just when Vince first started uh, taking over, when he started expanding. And um, one of the local guys down here that we had met was a fellow by the name of Joe Mascaro, who had done some jobs for Vince Sr. And he was retired and living here in Florida, and he was working some of our shows. So when the WWF back then expanded to Hollywood, their first shot in Miami was in Florida, was in the Hollywood Sportatorium. And uh, Joe got in contact with uh, Vince Jr. 
Uh, and this was around the time where Vince Senior passed away. So I guess I guess Joe called and they gave his condolences, and then basically explained to Vince that you know he was living down here, and he, if he could be any of assistance, he would help him out and uh, push him to shove. The first show down here, Joe got to work the opener, and uh, he brought us out there, and uh, a couple of our guys went out there, and we were introduced to, uh, I think it was Pat Patterson at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, next thing I know, we were going up to the TV, up in Poughkeepsie, New York. Oh, what were those? What was uh, what was Pat Patterson like? And did you uh, did were you ever around Vince very often? Or early on, I mean, Pat and Joe Scarpa or Chief Jay Strongbow were the two guys that we were more familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, after one of the tapings in Poughkeepsie, we were we were over in a bar in, in uh, um, one of the Holiday Inns up there, and I wound up sitting at the same table with the Vince and uh, the guy who was booking for them at the time, George Scott, and. Uh, he was very cordial for us, and he always treated us well. And I mean, of course, I never had any real business dealings with Vince over a contract, so you know, my opinion might be different than some other people. Yeah, yeah. Now, during that time in wrestling, because obviously that that changed the whole landscape of wrestling once WWF started to kind of cherry pick different guys from all the ter- and the territory started to go away, and uh, uh, what were some, you know, some of the other wrestlers you knew? Uh, what did they think of Vince? Well, I mean, you know, at the time, uh, it was it was just in the beginning stages of their expansion, and I mean, you know, everybody was making great money, and then the thing that it is is there was uh, the only problems they had were the tremendous travel schedule back then, because there were guys that were wrestling seven nights a week, and I mean, they would go two, three weeks without days off, so. But, I mean, most of the people seemed that they enjoyed working up there. You know, it was just the travel schedule that killed people. Mm-hmm. Lynch Man? I mean, I, yeah, go oh, on, sorry. I, I was going to say, I mean, I, I, I never had anybody that really had anything bad to say about him at that time, you know. Mm-hmm. Lynch Man, did you have a question? Yeah, David from the Facebook page. He mentions that you had a hand in training Luna Vachon, Gangrel, and Norman Smiley. He'd like to hear some stories about that. No, that's true. I mean, uh, Luna had already been broken into the business, and she had went to Moolah's camp, the fabulous Moolah's camp in South Carolina. And, uh, of course, Luna's uh, stepfather was uh, Paul Butcher Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, So at the time when I met Luna, she was uh, engaged to Dick Slater. And uh, Luna uh, was interested, along with a guy by the name of Howard Brody, who later went on to be the president of the NWA. Yeah. They were looking to start up a uh, promotion for the women called Wild Women of Wrestling. And uh, Luna was going to try to open a school and, or, you know, to help train some of the girls down here. And since I had a school and I had a room, I kind of, between Slater and myself, we worked with the girls a lot. And, and I got to work a lot with Luna. So, I mean, but, but she was already trained. I mean, we just polished things up and, you know, you know, but she was a hell of a student, and she was a little crazy, but she was one of the sweetest girls you'd ever know. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, when, you're, when you uh, go to WWF, and um, who are some of the guys you know there that you, you would say you really enjoyed uh, working with and some of the guys you would uh, – were there any guys you prefer not to work with? Um, you know, there was a couple. Of, I mean, anywhere you go, it's going to be like that. I mean – uh, mostly I had good experiences up there, and I mean, I, it was an honor. I was a young kid just breaking in, and I mean, I wound up having the chance to work and, and wrestle against probably about 10 or 12 different guys that are eventually in the Hall of Fame. So, I mean, I was working some of the top talent in the business, and you can't go wrong like that. Yeah, and I, I mean, you had one of the only, at that, you know, until later on when, when he was on TV a lot, like kind of in the WCW days, but... One of the only uh, 80s, I think, televised matches with the Hulkster, with Hulk Hogan. Yeah, you know, it was funny. I mean, it, it, what you say is true because I look back over it, and I think he had in, in the events years before, you know, before he really, later in his career, he had only worked like three television shots. I mean, all he did was promos and maybe highlight packages, and, uh, you know, it's a funny story. I mean, I went up there. We were doing TV. It was up in Poughkeepsie at the Mid-Hudson Civic Center. And I'm downstairs as, as 
as normal when we arrived at the building, we'd let Chief Jerry Strongbow, who was doing the TVs, we'd let him know we were here, you know, and um, I went down, and as I was looking, Jerry had the big board up, and, and back then we taped three hours in one night, three hours with the TV, three weeks, and uh, I saw a spot on the board where it said Hulk Hogan, the you know, versus, and it was a blank spot. And as I was talking to Jay, I was looking at it, and I said, Jay, you know, I don't want to sound like a mark, but I wouldn't mind having that spot if you could give it to me. Yeah. And he was like, oh, no problem. And he penciled it in. He goes, I had you in mind. And I'm going, son of a bitch, that was good. I should have done that more often, you know. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, what kind? Of, what was that experience like? Uh, you know, the height of Hulkamania being in the ring with, with Hogan. Well, I think that, that pops it right there because at the time he was the biggest money maker and, and money draw in, in the business, and you know, it was an honor to get the chance to work him. And, uh, you know, of course, they were just starting the, the uh, angle with Hogan and Randy Savage. Mm-hmm. So the, 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 the match that night was they wanted me to come in. And they wanted someone who made it wasn't going to mess up because Elizabeth was involved and she was going to come out and challenge Hogan. And, you know, while Hogan turned his back to talk to her, I would jump Hogan from behind, get a few shots, and then he'd make his big comeback. And then, of course, he'd drop the leg on me. And, you know, before the ref could, the ref would get the top, and then Savage would come off the top rope and they'd start brawling. Mm-hmm. And they just wanted to make sure that there was somebody that would be smart enough to get out of the way and not hurt Elizabeth, you know? Uh-huh. And, I mean, I was kind of honored to get that spot. And, I mean, just the fact, you know, to mark out and get to work over, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, the only, and you said there's, like, three. I can. I, I just remember Hogan, uh, besides, like, Saturday's main event, uh, for, like, the, the Saturday morning and Sunday morning shows, it was uh, you and uh, it was, uh, I forget his name, but it was uh, one of the Asian wrestlers. I remember he wrestled. And, yeah. Uh, I know he worked Moon Dog Spot once on TV, and I think him and Orndorff did a tag against somebody. Okay. Like, you know, that's about all I remember him working. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was Hogan like? Uh, did, were you around him, you know, much? I, you know, I, I talked to him a few times on the uh, uh, live events before we worked, and uh, it was a little interesting was that uh, one of Hogan's good friends or workout partners from back in Minnesota was a kid that I wound up training, and that was Corporal Kirchner, mm-hmm. who later on had a big you know, run up there after Slaughter left. And um, it was kind of an inside, you know, when I first met Hogan was in the dressing room here in Miami at the Knight Center. And, uh, you know, Hogan had commented that uh, Kirchner had showed him a few tapes of us. And, you know, I was, it was pretty proud because Hogan said, oh, I saw you work, I think you're a hell of a worker. And I was like, wow, you know. Yeah. Here I am, a nobody, and, and then here the champ recognized us, you know, from some, you know, indie tapes that he'd seen, and I thought that was pretty cool. So, I mean, he could have blown us off, but I mean, you know, I thought he was very cordial and very, you know, uh, cool with us. Yeah, definitely. Uh, who were some of the guys like you would travel with uh, during your WWF run? Well, you know, it was mostly, because we were just going up doing TV, so it was mostly a lot of the job guys and the underneath guys. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ricky Santana was working up there at the time, and you know, Ricky and I broke in together, and uh, he was wrestling back then as Aldo Marino. So it would be Ricky, myself. Um, there was a guy that used to play for the Miami Dolphins named Joe Moto, who was doing jobs for them, and, and a kid named Jimmy Young, who were two guys that I helped train. And we were all going up. There was four or five of us. They called us the Florida Boys, and we all came up to do TVs every week, or every three weeks. Yeah, because they used to tape every three weeks. Now, um, growing up in New England, uh, one of my favorite. And uh, what do you think? Of, before I get to that question, what do you think of the term you brought up, uh, job guy? All right, do you get offended by that or? <clears throat> Not really. I mean, you know, I mean, there's a lot of different names. They call us enhancement talent, job guys, under guys. I mean, you know, it's it's a job. <laughs> mm-hmm. We got paid very well to do it. So, mm-hmm. I, I saying, mean, yeah, I know some guys do take offense to it, but you know, it, it was a position and it was it was a spot. I mean, that's you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, like I said, it gave me the opportunity to work on the biggest promotions and work against a number of Hall of Fame talent and some tremendous wrestlers over the years. I mean, I got to work 
uh, you know, the British Bulldogs, Wyndham and Rotundo, and, you know, some of the best tag teams. And I got to work some single matches, you know, with, uh, you know, Andre the Giant, Ricky Steamboat, uh, you know, Hogan and, and Paul Orndorff and a few others. So, I mean, I had a nice run. Yeah. What I was going to say was uh, growing up in New England, uh, my favorite, uh, one of my favorite guys was uh, the Duke of Dorchester, Pete Doherty. I was really happy we got him on the show last year. And, uh, yeah, I would just wonder if you had any stories w- about the Duke of Dorchester. Cause I would yeah. kick out there was a show on it, which was the precursor to Monday Night Raw. It was called Tuesday Night Titans. Mm-hmm. And it was basically a talk show with inter- 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 spliced with the highlights. And it was Vince McMahon was, was, was doing the commentary on it. And uh, we were called up to, uh, they filmed it in Baltimore. And we were called up to do a piece on that, which they were calling the uh, Unsung Heroes of Wrestling. Yeah. And uh, myself, Paul Roma, uh, Jimmy Powers, uh, Louis, uh, was it Jose Luis Rivera, and a few others, and the Duke of Dorchester met us up there. Mario Mancini was we, on that one, too. I think, yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it was, it was fun because, uh, you know, it was an interesting, you know, first time we really got to do any kind of an interview, and uh, most of the guys were pretty nervous. And, and I mean, it, it went well. I mean, I, I, my spot went pretty well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, I, I went on with uh, Paul, I believe. It was, no, it was Jimmy Powers and Jose Luis Rivera. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> one of the segments that we were doing the interviews you know, they asked me, uh, well, Vince told me, he said, in one of the commercial breaks, he said, I'm going to ask you if you thought you could have a, if a manager would help you. So I gave a little speech, about, well, not a speech, but a little spot where I was talking about how my career would improve exponentially if Bobby Heenan or someone would be my manager. And I mean, it was a good chance to, you know, get a little bit of, of, of talk time on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I brought the, I brought that episode up uh, last week on the show because, uh, you know, I, I grew up watching TNT. I, I, I thought it was silly, but it was a very memorable show. And uh, that particular episode, and I always thought you and uh, the Duke of Dorchester were, were the standouts of uh, that particular episode. And, by the way, that's on the network now, too. So, yeah, yeah so I, people like me can relive it, or people who have never seen it can go and watch it. For my right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> You know, it's funny because the, one of the closing segments on there, they had interviewed Jose Luis Rivera, and Jose is a great guy, but he didn't speak English very well, and he was kind of nervous. And, you know, Vince, uh, Lord Al Hayes was on there, a great guy and, and a tremendous, you know, person. And, I mean, one of the lines Vince said toward the end when they were doing their recap of what we had just said, you know, Lord Al Hayes made the comment. He said, oh, Jimmy Powers has these big arms. He's a great guy. And, you know, Jose Luis Rivera is this and that. And then he started to say something. I looked at him and I said, look, buddy. I said, I've seen you wrestle. You should just sit on the end of the chair and be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I just brought a smile to Vince's face because somebody just actually came out and healed a little bit. Because everybody else was just being very straight, you know. Yeah, like kind of hum- just kind of like the humble, you know, nice guy. But yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then Vince had said something to me during one of the breaks. He said that uh, they're bringing Pedro Morales back at the time, who was a legendary champion up there. And, uh, you know, Jose, you know, they wanted Jose to say that he admired Pedro and that was his hero, you know. So when Jose was trying to say that, I looked over and I started giggling. And Vince said, What are you laughing at? And I said, For God's sake, McManus, is you got one that's a husband and one will never be, you know. <laughs> and I mean, again, Vince started grinning because you know, he, he just wanted someone to be a you know, live landish, and <laughs> I thought that was cool, you know. So he got complimented by the <laughs> the producer was old uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling uh, host Freddie Miller, and afterwards Freddie came up and said, "Oh, that was outstanding, man." He goes, "You really need to, you know." He goes, "That was good, you know." So mm-hmm. that made me proud, made me happy, you know. Yeah, it was uh, so. Like uh, how you said, you know, during the commercial, Vince said he was going to ask you a question. So, how much of that show was like thought out beforehand, and how much of it was pretty much just uh, kind of done on the fly? Well, I think it was like fifty-fifty. I mean, they had an idea what they wanted, and they really didn't say much to us. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, just say, look, here's you're going to have a few seconds. So, you know, 
And I mean, like Vince would 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 key us in a little bit about you know wh- what line of question he was going to go with, and then it was pretty much up to us to respond, you know. And uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm sure nowadays it's much more scripted, but I mean back then a lot of the stuff was done on the fly, you know. Yeah, which to, to me it adds a, a certain uh, charm and uh, makes it special. Like when you, you're not sure what's going to happen. Well, you know, I mean, I think it, it creates more for the boys, for the wrestling, because you, you have to be more involved in your own character development. Mm-hmm. And nowadays, everything is handed to you, and you're told to do, here's your life. You know, back then, it was basically, you know, it was up to you to make it work, you know. And, I mean, granted, it, it, it wasn't the push we'd have wanted up there, but, I mean, it was still a chance to ad lib and show that we could talk if we were given the chance, you know. Mm-hmm. It's weird because I don't think there's I've ne- I've never heard any one wrestler um, you know from Stone Cold Steve Austin to Jericho to guys like Jim Ross anybody's like really been in the business who uh, who would say that they think the scripted uh, promos are better than when it's just you know people doing it from coming up with their own uh, verbiage and and you know speaking from the heart so it, it's all it, to me it's all it seems like you it's like more work than needed for uh, not as good as as uh, product as as you'd want. Well, you know, I think it's it's it. Uh, I mean, as far as a wrestler or a talent goes, if you're given a gimmick or you're given a character, mm-hmm. it's easier to understand it if you create it yourself. Right. You know, when it's handed to you and, and you're just given a script, it's hard to get into it and it's hard to make it believable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's what's missing in a lot of the, the guys today. Is that you know if there's a mistake or somebody misses a cue or misses a line, they're lost. They don't know how to add wood, and I think that's one of the biggest things missing in today's business. Mm-hmm. I just want to add real quick too. We had Jose Luis Rivera on uh, last year, and I and I'll agree that yes, he is he is a very nice guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, he's a, yeah. I, mean, I see him every now and then on Facebook nowadays, and we chat a little bit, you know. But uh, I enjoy Jose. He, he was fun to be around. Yeah. Uh, the Duke was a character in himself. I mean, when we rode back to the hotel after the show, Howard Finkel stopped and bought us a case of beer. And, of course, the Duke and I probably killed most of that. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a character to say the least. Yeah. I, I really got a heat for a short period of time because we used to, when I was a kid on Net- NASA, New England Sports Network, they would show every month the um, the Boston Garden show, which was great because – Back then, you really didn't see anything besides superstars, and uh, yeah, and for a short period of time, it was just a few months. But he did uh, color commentary, and I always remember it because I thought he was he was great at it. And uh, yeah. he would have uh, you know, they would have went with him longer because I, I really did enjoy his uh, commentary. He was he was a character, and he was very funny. And I mean, mm-hmm. I thought he could have done well with it too. I don't know what the reasoning was. I mean, maybe he just wasn't a big enough national name. But, you know, I thought if they let him run with it a little bit, he could have done well. Yeah, because I still, I still uh, quote him, and that was, like I said, I was probably 10 or something. But he, um, like, like they would show the replay of uh, you know, the heel cheating, and he would go, ah, it's an optical illusion. And I always thought, that's like the greatest <laughs> line I ever heard. And, uh, so you would get the voice, you get the voice down well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, it, it's funny, and I, and I mean, there are a lot of guys uh, down here in Florida. We used to get the Boston Garden feed. Mm-hmm. I mean, the original before the cable really blew up the way it is nowadays. The old USA Network was called the Madison Square Garden Channel. Okay. And on Monday nights, we would get the you know the show from the Garden. Uh, one week we would get the show from the Tap Center in Washington and then Landover, and then we'd get the Boston Garden feed too. And, I mean, down here in South Florida, so that was pretty interesting, I mean, before I started wrestling up that way. Yeah. And then eventually, you know, it would expand to become USA Network, and then, it, you know, it really take, took off along with the Superstation in Atlanta, you know. Because mm-hmm. back then, everything was done was uh, uh, syndicated TV, and, I mean, you know, you didn't have the national exposure that they have now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is. Uh, I really love watching those shows, and uh, some of those are on the network, I think. And I still have some of my old VHS tapes where I used to record them off TV. Cause, uh, wow. that was, yeah, it was a big highlight for me as a kid. 
Uh, it's, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's been yeah. another question from the chat room or the um, Facebook? Yeah, Seth from the chat room. He wants to know what it was like working against Andre the Giant. Uh, it was interesting. I mean, when I first met Andre, uh, you know, we were just green. It was uh, my first, actually, it was my first week up there. And, and I had done really nothing. And, and you know, I'm, I'm sitting in the back, this green kid, nervous as hell. And, uh, you know, I finally get one of the agents comes over and he says, well, kid, you're working Andre, you know. Uh, he's sitting over there, go over and talk to him, see what he wants to do. You know, that was my first introduction to Andre. And uh, as, of course, you know, legend would have it, Andre was a legendary drinker. I mean, he could put away incredible amounts of alcohol. And I'm this, you know, green rookie, and I'm walking over to him, and I'm shaking, you know, Mr. 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 Andre, my name's Rusty Burks, and I said, we're wrestling tonight. Uh, is there anything you want to do? And I'm looking down, and there's two three-liter bottles of wine next to him that are empty. And he's got a third one in his hand. And he's playing cards with a couple of the boys, you know. And he looks up at me, and he belches, and he goes, Do whatever the fuck you want, kid. And I'm like, oh, shit, I'm going to die. I just walked and walked away. <laughs> so we go out into the ring, and, and, you know, they just told me basically, you know, just do whatever Andre wants, and, you know, he'll hit you with his finish. And it, it'll be about a four-minute, five-minute deal, you know. So I go to the ring, and they introduce me. And, I mean, I'm already nervous because this is my first time up there, and there's 3,000, 4,000 people in this New Hudson Civic Center up in Poughkeepsie. You know, and there's Bruno San Martino and Vince doing the live commentary from the stage, and you know Andre walks out, and, and it was a it was an easy match. I mean, there was nothing to it. Mm -hmm. And to tell you how different it was back then, they Andre, and of course Andre knew, but I didn't. Nobody told me. And about three minutes into the match, Kamala walks out with his manager, and they're, they're still in the stare down, and Andre's then he turned in the corner, and I'm looking like. What the hell is this? You know, I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> and I mean, they just did the whole thing and never chewed me in about it. And, you know, so we just did the match. And when Andre hit his big finish on me, you know, I just took the fall, took the fall. And, uh, you know, after that, every time I'd see Andre, it was like, hello, oh, boss, how are you? And he was one of the nicest guys, you know. Hmm. But my first introduction to him, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're this green kid, you know, and here you are, you're getting in the ring with the eighth wonder of the world, you know. <laughs> and when you introduce yourself to him, he's already got two, three little bottles of wine drank. It's a fun one. I don't mean to you know, stretch this out, but, you know, here we are. Uh, I was, it was Ricky Santana, which, of course, I said, I was Mario. Joe Murto, Jimmy Young, and myself, and our buddy Joe Mascara, who got us up to do TV. I mean, we're here in Florida, and Joe calls us and says, hey, guys, I got, I got your book. You're going to the WWF, you know. And we're, like, crapping ourselves, like, oh, my God, you know, this is the biggest break of our career. I've only been wrestling for a year and a half, and it was all outlaw stuff, you know. So, yeah, and Joe, he was a bullshit artist. I mean, a good guy. I loved him to death, but... He's talking us all the way up on a plane and a building that, you know, oh, they're going to love you because I was 400 pounds at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm just blowing sunshine at my ass like it's going on. And my head's swelling the whole thing. And I, you know, he's telling me, oh, brother, you're going to be the next gorilla monsoon because you move. You move. I mean, I could drop kick back then. I could move pretty good for a fat guy, you know. Mm -hmm. By the time we got there, we thought we were going to win the title that night. <laughs> and I mean, you know, we land in Newark, and then we drive up to upstate New York to Poughkeepsie, you know. So, I mean, we get in the whole ride in the car, and Joe's blowing sunshine up our asses. I mean, he's telling Aldo, you know, Ricky Santana, he said, oh, you're going to be the next Pedro Morales. You speak Spanish. They love Latin guys. And, you know, and we're just, oh, my goodness, you know. And then we get to the building and we're knocking on the door trying to get in and nobody knew who the fuck Joe was or who we were. <laughs> and we go, oh my God, we just, 
you know, we just came up here for nothing. <laughs> and then they finally let us in, you know, it was like, well, what are you sweating bullets, you know? <laughs> and I mean, of course, I look on the board, they have the big board posted where they have all three hours of TV. And, you know, again, like I said, Joe was blowing so much sunshine up our ass, it wasn't even funny, you know. Mm. And I mean, I on the board in the first hour, I've got Andre the Giant. In the second hour, I got the Free Birds. And it's like, <laughs> son of a bitch, Joe. I said, I can't believe I'm going to go over on all these guys. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, they burst the bubble and uh, we were putting guys over, which was cool. But when you're a green kid and your head is swollen, you know, <laughs> it, it was a rude awakening. Yeah. That, that's interesting you mentioned uh, the Free Birds because, uh, you know, they weren't there very long in WWE. Maybe, maybe only that one show. I don't know. But uh, uh, what are your memories of the of, of the Freebirds in WWE, WWF at the time? I, I had a good match with them. I mean, you know, I enjoyed working with Terry Gordy. Uh, you know, who later on you know, had a legendary career in Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Buddy Roberts was a grizzled vet, and Michael Hayes was just Michael Hayes. You know, uh, I enjoyed my match with them. You know, and. They were over like a million dollars. They were working babyface up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's when they had Cindy Lauper with them, and then you know the whole rock and roll wrestling thing. Mm-hmm. And it was pretty cool. You know, a, a funny little anecdote or story with Buddy Roberts, and, and um, during the match, you know, we had set up a spot where they wanted Terry to give me the slam because again, I was four hundred, and we were trying to get Terry over as being this big, strong badass, which he legitimately was. So we do a little spot where I I did something with Buddy Roberts, I mean with uh, Terry. Terry gave me the big slam, and he tags Buddy, and Buddy gets up on the top rope, and he goes to give me an elbow. So I get up and I feed into it, and I you know he caught me fairly good with it, you know. So I mean the match went on, everything was cool, you know. Afterwards they said everything was great and so forth. So <laughs> the following night we're in West Palm Beach or whatever it was. And uh, I, I'm sitting in the back, and Buddy walks up to me, and he goes, God damn you, kid, you, 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 you broke my freaking rib. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and I'm looking at him, and I go, you what? And he goes, when you come off the top rope, you broke my rib, you stiff prick, you know? And I'm like, holy shit, you know? And I mean, again, I'm this green, this green freaking rookie, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sitting down there, and I'm going, God damn, man. Oh, buddy, he struts away, you know? And I'm sitting there with this depressed look, like someone just burst my freaking bubble, you know? And Terry Gordy sits down next to me and he goes, kid, he goes, don't believe that shit. He goes, that drunk bastard fell off the toilet into the bathtub and broke his room last night. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, you son of a bitch, you know. <laughs> and he's going to rip on me, you know. <laughs> but uh, they were good guys. I really liked them. You know? Yeah. Nope. Um, speaking of ribs, you said about working uh, with the British Bulldogs and um, – They've been notorious for ribs. Uh, what was it like uh, working with the British Bulldogs? That was interesting. I mean, uh, you know, they were a great tag team, and it was fun to work with them, you know. I mean, unfortunately for me or whatever, we didn't really get a whole lot of time, you know. Mm-hmm. I worked like two or three times, and, and both times there were only short matches. But, um, you know, Dynamite was uh, a tremendous wrestler, very solid. Uh, I would have loved to have done more with them. But, you know, you, you do what you're told, and you do it in the time you're allotted. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, really, at that time, Davy Boy was so green. You know, he was just breaking in. And uh, the, the two of them were really just driving for the first time. And uh, But they were good to work with, you know. And, of course, they were in, in the midst of starting their run as the tag champs. So that was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, when we had um, Mario Mancini on, he talked. Uh, he was really, um, he really liked um, uh, the Chief, Chief J. Strongbow, but uh, he was really against um, Patterson. And uh, did, did you, he said that you know Patterson would uh, uh, give special favors to, to Lombardi. This is what he said on the show. And uh, did you see any of that uh, while you were there? No, not really. And, and, I mean, Lombardi had just started working there at the time, too. So, I mean, you know, I pretty much kept to myself. I mean, as far as I didn't try to get involved in anything. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I don't know, I've heard people say the same thing about Pat, but I've never had a problem with Pat. Pat was always great to us. I mean, he treated me with respect. And, you know, Pat was, 
<laughs> from a personal standpoint, standpoint on the live shows when we used to get paid at the event because we were, you know, we were independents. We were non-contract. You know, Pat always paid better. <laughs> I mean, Chief was a great guy. I love the Chief. Mm-hmm. I mean, I grew up watching him as Joe Scarpa here in Florida, you know. Yeah, and, and I mean, Pat was just uh, you know out of the two of them. I mean, I, I, a good friend of mine was Ricky Hunter, the original Gladiator here in Florida. And uh, when Rick and Rick and I traveled together quite a bit uh, toward the end of Rick's career, when he was going up there and putting people over, but him and Pat were longtime friends, you know. So I mean, I got along great with him, and I you know maybe I didn't have the body that Pat was interested in, but uh, <laughs> you know. I don't have any stories or anything like that. I never saw him do anything that wasn't, you know. I mean, everyone knew that he was gay. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's, it's not that it was a big secret. And I, I always thought Pat was a professional. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I don't know anything about him. I've never met him. I just know, but uh, just in my opinion, the people that do like him, I mean, there's Bret Hart and Austin and uh, for, from s- small guys on the card to, you know, huge superstars on the card and, uh, for me, if if those guys uh, speak highly of him and say he's a great finish man and all these things, oh my goodness, yeah, he could call some finishes, and, and he had a brilliant mind for the business, you know. And I mean, what people don't realize is all those major, major mega pay per views, all those angles and finishes were packs. Mm-hmm. And I mean, one of the things that made them such a successful organization was that before the before the uh, advent of writers and story writers, you know, if Vince had an idea, you know, whatever idea Vince had, Pat made it work. Mm-hmm. You know, so I mean, as far as the wrestling business went, and I think, you know, I think he was the mastermind behind a lot of their success up there, you know, and Scarpa was too. Scarpa was a great ring general, and I mean, I was, it was an honor to meet him because again, as a young man here in Florida, you know, back when I was a kid, the main events were Joe Scarpa and the Gladiator against the great Malenko and a guy named Hans Mortier. You know, and I mean, this is what I, as a little kid, I went to the convention center to watch them, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, later on, you know, get to meet him was a tremendous honor. You know, I'd sit and talk with Jay. You know, and, and I mean, I had a, I had a distinct advantage because early on when they were wrestling here in Florida, I used to rent them my ring. This was before they had their own ring trucks and all this. They used to get the rings all done locally. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I would get to the arena real early, and I would always get to sit and chat with them, you know. And I was always fun, and you could always learn stuff talking to them. Mm-hmm. So, um, what what um what led to you uh, to leaving the WWF? Was that your decision, or was that their decision? Uh, it was pretty much my decision because, uh, I mean, I had been up there for a couple of years, and obviously I really wasn't going to go anywhere or do anything. And a lot of that was my own doing. Uh, I mean, at the time I had had custody of my 10 month old son and I really wasn't in a position to be able to travel or go anywhere, you know? And by the time my run had ended up there in the WWF, or, you know, this is before they kicked me and the F out. But when my run, you know, after my second year there, they had uh, decided to uh, slow down coming here into Florida, which is where my home was. And, you know, I, I made most of my, my money and, and a lot of my matches because whenever they came to Florida, I would rent them the ring all over the state and I would carry the ring and then I would also wind up working all the shows. So when they slowly started to back out of Florida, it was like, wow, you know, this is going to be a waste of time. And I decided to try to come to work here for Eddie Graham, you know, in, in Florida Championship Wrestling. So, it was kind of my decision, and it was kind of a, you know, a party. I mean, a couple of years later, I went back up and did a few more TVs for them, but I never really uh, got back there, you know, in any kind of a full-time or even part-time capacity after that. Mm-hmm. But uh, they treated you well. and uh... Oh, yeah. And I mean, I, you know, they always booked me on, on the live shows back then, even if you weren't on the card. Like, whenever they came to Florida, they would make room for us, you know. And, I mean, Ricky, uh, Aldo Marino, uh, Joe Murto, and myself, Corporal Kirchner, when he was still wrestling underneath his R.T. Reynolds, we would always work the openers when they came to Florida. So, you know, besides doing the TVs, and then, you know, a couple of the guys got to go to Australia and, and, and stuff for them. 
on uh, different tours. And so, I mean, you know, we, we kept active, but it really wasn't enough to make a living. So, I mean, that's when I eventually decided to try to come to work here in Florida, mm-hmm. so, which, of course, was a, a, a like a night and day awakening, you know, because when I came here to work, it was pretty much the end of Florida Championship Wrestling. They were about to go under. Eddie Graham had already passed away, and it was, uh, I believe it was Hiro Matsuda and Duke Kiyomuka were running the territory then, you know. Mm. How, you know, yeah. talk about how different would you say the territory days had, had been from when you broke in till you know, a few years later when you're leaving WWF to, uh, you know, then you go back to the territories. How, how much of that they changed? I changed it enormously because when I first broke in, they were, the territories were on their, you know, at the top of their their existence. Mm-hmm. Vince had just begun to consider expanding when I went to work for him. Um, as a matter of fact, I think he was in Florida. We were on the first couple of shows when he came into Florida. You know, and this is when he was doing his, his nationwide expansion. And it was before Black Saturday when, you know, went on PBS, and it was before, you know, it was still when everything was syndicated and Vince was buying the, the TV times all over the country. And, uh, of course, when he started to expand is when the territory started to go under, you know. And, and I mean, uh, you know, so when I left Vince, I started coming, I, I came down here to Florida to work because I was living down here. Um, I had got in contact with uh, Barry Wyndham, who, who introduced me to Bob Roop, and then Bob, you know, Bob hired me down here for Florida, and, and it was just like night and day. I mean, you know, we would we would be, be working, and, and back then when they were in Florida, they were in the James All Night Center in Miami, and they were doing 7,000, you know, sell out. You know, they didn't sell out as much in the South, but all, all the Northern shows were packed and sell outs, so... You know, and then you come to Florida Championship Wrestling, and, and you know they had made their, their their heyday of working in smaller buildings like high schools or national guard armories and stuff. You know, and the big building was the Miami Beach Auditorium, you know, which later became the Jackie Gleason Theater. But uh, that was their big big arena, you know, along with the uh, Fort Homer Hester Armory in Tampa. And but by the time I came to Florida, the houses were down, and then. The territory was, you know, not too far away from closing. Um, Seth here in the chat room, he wants to know, uh, can you, uh, how much harder were the rings uh, back at that time? Well, I mean, nowadays the rings are like Taj Mahal of rings, you know, because Vince owns them all. Uh, yeah. And I mean, on his tractor semi-trailer, they have two or three different rings in there. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, back in the day, they were all... Uh, rented locally, they were, you know, it was a whole different ballgame. And I mean, you could go one night and have a ring that you could bump all over and it was fantastic. And the next one night you'd get a ring that was like a concrete floor, you know. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the things that was, was, was hurting the boys, you know, because they were traveling and wrestling seven nights a week, you know, which was unheard of. And I mean, I remember talking to Rocky Johnson when I was up there and we had worked and and Rocky had told me at the time he had done 21 straight days and he got one day off and he was out on the West Coast and he lived in Florida. So by the time he'd fly home, kiss the wife, pack the bags and fly back out, you know. And I mean, it was killing the guys, the schedule. And I mean, they were running two, three shows a night, seven nights a week. And I mean, yeah, the rings were horrible, you know, in some places. And then I was in the north where they had their own rings that were good, mm-hmm. you know. But but you could get in some really nasty. I mean, one of the things, and this is ironic, you ask that question. When they came to Florida originally, on the first show that I, I previously mentioned out at the Hollywood Sportatorium, the ring fell apart during the show, and that's what. <laughs> That's when uh, my buddy Joe Mascara had mentioned to Patterson, hey, Rusty has a great ring. And next thing I know, I get a call from the office, and they wanted to book my ring in, you know, right here in Miami, you know, in, in Miami and uh, West Palm Beach. And I was okay, that's great. You know, I, I got paid well for it. And about a m- couple of months later, they ran a swing through Florida, and they had a sellout house up in Pensacola, and the ring didn't show up. So they wound up having the fight. There was this old house ring in the back of the building that they wound up using, and they didn't have ropes for it. So 
here you are with a sellout crowd in a ring with no ropes, and they had to do the show. Mm-hmm. And, of course, that killed the business in Pensacola for a couple of months. So, you know, the following month, they come to Miami, and as soon as I walk in the building, yeah, I already set up, and I, was, I went over to talk to Scarpa and, or Strongo, and he asked me, he goes, what would it take for you to rent the ring all over Florida? And I said, well, I'd be happy to, you know. So I mean, it, it benefited me because I got the, you know, I had a pretty good ring. The boys loved it. And I mean, for about a year and a half, two years, I was running that ring from, you know, from Jacksonville to Miami. So it was cool. Mm-hmm. Was, uh, you know, because you, you talked about being a big guy. Uh, how, how was that on your body, uh, you know, being a wrestler? Uh, did that take its toll, toll on you? You know, when I was active, I really didn't notice it that much. I mean, I never, I was fortunate, knock on wood, that I really didn't have many injuries. I mean, I've had some pulled muscles, and, you know, I've had some ligament damage in my knees that I never had to have surgically repaired. But now that I'm older, I'm feeling a lot of it. Now I'm retired, you know. When we had our little cold spell this week, my, my hip, my neck, my, my shoulders are killing me. I've got rotator cuff tears in both shoulders, you know. But, I mean, when I was active, I didn't notice any of it, really. I mean, well, you know, you, got, you, you had bangs and bruises, but mm-hmm. I was very fortunate that when I was active, I never really missed a whole lot of time. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, I think the only thing I ever did was I broke a bone in my collarbone, and I missed three or four weeks. And I think uh, when I was working for Eddie Graham down here at Florida Championship Wrestling, I had broke a bone in my foot, you know. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I really didn't miss any time. I just taped it up and, you know, I was able to suck it up and work through it. Mm-hmm. Were, were you an athlete before getting into wrestling? Did you do anything like in school? Well, in my mind I was, but I don't know if people would actually say that. But, I mean, I played football. Not that I played, you know, I, I really only played football in high school. I never wrestled. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was just a pro wrestling fan. I really didn't get into the, interested in the amateur wrestling. I, I should have. Uh, I played uh, high school ball. Uh, I was a lot better than my coaches thought I was, you know. Mm-hmm. And then I wound up playing a year of minor league football, which was a joke. But I mean, it was, you know. So I mean, I really wouldn't. I wouldn't say I was a great athlete, but I mean, you know, as far as wrestling went, you know, I was fortunately for being four hundred and seven pounds, I could move and I could bump. I mean, you know, not as well as some of the lightweights, but, you know, I never had anybody complain about having to work me, so. Yeah. Now, as a wrestler, would you, per- did you prefer having matches where you were the big guy against a, a smaller guy or working with, uh, you know, other big guys? It really, you know, it, it really didn't matter. It just it depended on who the guy was. I mean, you know, I've had some great matches with some smaller guys, and then I've had some good matches, and, you know, what I thought were really good matches with big guys. I mean, <laughs> it really didn't matter to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I enjoyed it. I, I had a nice year-long run at Global where we got to work the Malenko brothers, Joe and Dean. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, Dean was, you know, the one that played it nationally when I was with WWE, WCW. And Joe was more of the big name in Japan. And uh, they were just fantastic athletes. And, I mean, I just so it was such an enjoyable time to work with them because they were so smooth and, you know, I don't know, for whatever reason, Joe and I seemed to click together. I mean, his dad, you know, Joe was known throughout the business as a shooter and a guy that could stretch you and a you know, no-nonsense kind of guy, but we always had good matches. And his dad used to tell me, he goes, I don't know what it is about you, Tip, but Joe seems to like working you. And I'm like, well, thank God, because if he didn't, he'd probably stretch me from one end of the ring to the other. Uh, I've heard <laughs> he, he, yeah. he was more of the showman and more of the, you know, uh, like, of course, Dean had, if you really look at it, Dean had the more prolific career as far as national. Mm-hmm. But uh, as far as being a shooter, Joe was unmatched. I mean, you know. Mm-hmm. I remember yeah. they were both, uh, the first time I saw both of them was uh, in ECW. They both went there. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Joe. I, I don't know if he retired around that time or what, but you know, then Dean went on to go to WCW and then and WWE. And um, well, Joe, Joe was a pharmacist, so he had a he had a real good job in Tampa, and okay, he could get away for the trips to Japan, and he could do some shows here and there. But you know, Joe also had a reputation as a guy that could, could do some damage if he wanted to. 
Mm-hmm. And, I mean, a lot of people were afraid to use Joe because, you know, <laughs> you know, it was just Joe was not not big into doing high spots and not big into doing the showmanship stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, Joe was raised and really, really raised and trained by Carl Gotch, who was a legendary hooker and shooter in this business, you know. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, Joe was basically cut from the same cloth. You know, whereas Dean was more the performer like his dad, although Dean could handle himself, you know. Mm-hmm. When you, you mentioned Global a couple times, and you said when you guys were doing Global, now, were you, uh, besides an active wrestler there, were you, uh, did you have any hand in the company itself? Uh, you could, a little bit. I mean, Bob Roop was the actual booker for Global, and, and my old friend and tag team partner, Dr. Red Roberts, was the uh, president of the company toward the you know, middle run and toward the end of it. And uh, I helped with the school, and I helped Bob a little bit with the booking. Uh, but basically, Bob was the booker, and, you know, I would make suggestions, and Bob would just laugh at me, or he would do it. And, I mean, Bob and I got along good, and, and, I mean, I really learned a lot from him. Uh, you know, but it was Bob and them calling the shots, and, you know, I mean, Red and I being close friends, we, you know, there was always conversations, and I got to sit in on a lot of the booking meetings. So, yeah, you could say I had a hand in the office. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andrew, did you have uh, another question? Yeah, I have yeah. a question from uh, the blue guy from the message board. He wants to know th- some of your thoughts on the super-duper Mario gimmick. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I mean, uh, thank you for asking that, uh, when I had worked for, after I left the WWF, and I, I had worked for International Championship Wrestling up in Maine for the Savoldis, mm-hmm. and uh, they had a pretty nice little promotion that ran up through Bangor, Maine, and, you know, Maine, Massachusetts. Was that and IWCCW? It was later, toward the end, yeah. When I, when I saw it, because I'm in... Yeah, they had merged with uh, World Class. And the, yeah, it was the, nice. And, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. And they also had a little run where the AWA was running with them here in Florida. But uh, I, I had worked as Rusty Brooks up there. Red Roberts and I were the international tag champs up there. We had a little feud going with Steve Kern and Stan Lane, and then we worked a bunch of other groups, the Putskis and a few others. And then I, we had left, and uh, I get a call one day out of the blue from Mario, and he, he said, well, hey, I'm in Fort Lauderdale, kid. Come on up. I want to talk to you. So I go up, and we're, we're sitting at a bar in, in, in off Commercial Boulevard down there in here in, in Fort Lauderdale, <clears throat> and uh, he says, i got an idea for you. He goes, I want to do a character with you based off the uh, Nintendo thing. And I'm thinking, well, okay. And, you know, he goes, you know, Captain Lou Albano is doing, uh, you know, Mario. Uh, yeah, the TV show. Mario uh, thing. And I said, okay. And he goes, well, we're going to do a spin on that, and we want you to be Super Duper Mario. <laughs> and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, how many beers have you had? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Are you on crack? You know? <laughs> and he's like, no, but I know, it'll work. You know, he goes, we'll get you that Popeil's uh, hairspray, and you know, we'll get a pair of overalls. And, and I'm looking at him like, are you friggin' nuts, you know? <laughs> I mean, I said, Mario, a year ago, Red and I were your top tag team up there, and I've worked heel for you the whole time. And he goes, brother, he goes, look, you, you, you get a little bit of an Italian accent, and we'll make you. And I said, okay. I said, I'll try it. I said, but this is going to be a joke, you know. And, I, you know, so I get all the crap together. I get the overalls, the plaid shirt, and, you know, I get the little beanie or whatever hat it was, and, you know, and, and I, I got a couple of cans of spray paint to do the hair, you know. So I get up there, and I think the first show we did was in, uh, uh, God, I don't know if it was either in Maine or in Massachusetts. I think it was Maine. I don't know. I don't remember, but, you know, he, he says, you're going to come out to the Nintendo theme. And he goes, for the first couple of weeks, all he want me to do is crush everybody. You know, and, and he goes, invite the kids into the ring. Just have a ball with it. And I'm, so now, I, now the whole time, I'm trying to figure out an Italian accent, you know. So I'm a talking to like a super duper Mario, you know. <laughs> you know it, I thought he sounded more like the Iron Sheik than I did a freaking Italian, you know. 
I mean, you know, the first time I went out there and they start playing the music and there's a little buzz and I get in the ring and I got my little mallet and I worked some local guy up there and it was like a five, you know, not even five seconds, ten seconds. He jumps me, I knock him down, I double stomp on his stomach and I drop the elbow, one, two, three. And then they start playing the dee, 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 I invite the little kids in the ring and he kidding me, you know? So the next night, we did another town. I thought we were in, uh, God, I, I can't remember, North Attleboro in Mass or something like that, you know. And it's a bigger crowd, you know, and, and it, it gets over again. And so I go home, and the following month, cause I used to work for them, like, uh, we'd go up for eight, nine days each month, you know, because we didn't run full time, but he ran, he ran a lot of shows on a monthly basis, so. The next time I went up after it was on TV, the, the response was phenomenal. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me, you know? And I mean, we, we were doing a show in, um, I want to say, God, I can't, I, I, I've been hitting the head so many times, I don't remember all the times. But I think we were in uh, um, Bangor, Maine, or something like that, in Press Style or something in Maine. And I mean, it was. You know, they had about a thousand people in the building. The place was packed. And I know he was taping TV, which Mario did at every show. And I, I remember uh, the boys were pissed because it was cold, it was snowing, and we had to do a battle royal, so everybody had to hang out. And about three matches before the battle royal was my spot, so I go out and I do my little gimmick, and I, you know, hit the kid with the mallet and get the pin. And I start waving the kids in the ring, and there must have been a hundred kids in the ring, and they're bouncing up and down, and the damn ring broke. Oh, God. So, you know, it was so over. <laughs> and, of course, I was even more over with the boys because we couldn't do the battle royal. We could all get the hell out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew I was surprised at how well it took off. It was just that Mario, you know, slowly they ran out of money, and they couldn't afford to bring me up, and it was by the time. So, I mean, we never pursued it after that. And, I mean, I guess I could have, but, I mean, it, it really got over, and I didn't think it would. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, well, for that matter, some of the boys, uh, I'm in the back one night, you know, and I got the paint on and all the shit, and I'm sitting in the corner, and Bob Orton comes in, and, you know, I've known Bob from the WWF days, so I walk over, and I go, hey, Bobby, how you doing? And he's looking at me, and I say, Bob, it's me, Rusty. And he goes, shut up, little bitch. He's having nothing to do with all this shit on. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was cool. <laughs> and I mean, a funny, funny story, you know, because you had to, you know, like that spray paint would come off easy, you know. Mm -hmm. So I did my match one night, and there was this, this kid uh, who was doing TV for them, putting guys over. Uh, I think his name was really something. I don't remember his name. He was. Uh, a black kid from down around Virginia that used to drive up and do TV for them. Uh, and I'm in the back and I'm taking my shit off and we're going into the shower and a couple of boys are in there. And when I get into the shower, this kid's looking at me. I had, I had just worked him. You know, because he, so he only knew me as Super Duper Mario. Nobody ever, that's all they called me if it was Mario, you know. <laughs> Nobody called me Rusty, you know. So I'm in the shower and I'm under the tank, they you know, spill it off and it's just fucking, that, this dye was pouring out of my head, you know. <laughs> All of a sudden, he goes over and he goes, I know you, he goes, so I bet you was again. And I mean, that was the sort of guys we would work with, they were so dirty, they didn't know anything about the business. <laughs> you know, he was like Jack, you know, and it's like, well, you know, it's a different character, kid, you know. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Uh, you know, as I, I watch uh, when he said Boston Bad Boy, I mean, he was all over all, all the independents uh, here in New England as a kid. Yeah, he was a legend up there in the New England wrestling and stuff. Yeah, he was uh, He was a character, but he was fun to be around. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I also remember about that promotion was they had a lot of the guys that went on to to go to ECW, like they had. Uh, the Tasmaniac became uh, Taz, yeah. and they had uh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Were you were yeah. around those guys at that time, or did they come in laughter? No, no. I was, when, when, when I was working, uh, when Mario was coming here to Florida, he was bringing the guys down, and we went down to the Bahamas and a few, you know, Freeport and Nassau in the Bahamas. 
And um, I worked a kid named GQ Madison, you know, and I didn't know who the hell he was. He was a, you know, he was a young kid, brand new to the business, and <laughs> several years later, I found out that was Tommy Dreamer, you know, <laughs> because it, it's, it's funny. I mean, I, I went about six months ago to a show here in Coral Springs, Florida, for uh, a company called Coastal Championship Wrestling. Uh, and they had booked Tommy to come down. So, you know, I went over to say hello to some of the boys. And I never thought I met Tommy, so I go over to say hello to him. And he goes, he goes I know who you are. He goes, he goes I, you put me over. I mean, I put you over back in the Bahamas. And I said, son of a bitch, that was you, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, there was Tommy Dreamer. There was Tasmaniac. Um, there was a guy, and I, I forgot what he worked for, but he later went to Vince as Damian Demento. Yeah, yeah. What was his? Uh, it wasn't Tito, but I. Uh, God, that's gonna drive. I'm gonna. I mean, that's gonna drive me crazy now. I'm gonna try have to try. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was still something was his name. Uh huh. And yeah, and then there was of course there was the uh, 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 Public Enemy, which was Ted Teddy and Mike Williams. And, and, and Mike, and Mike, and his, his original tag team partner were called Zip and Zap, the Exterminator, the Terminators up in ICW. Mm -hmm. And I mean, much later, it's it's a funny, you know, how you people change and you don't realize it. But when several years, you know, ten years later, when, when ICW or ECW, I'm sorry, and a Paul Heyman's company came to Florida. They were on their first tour through here. They worked in the old baby radio arena down here. And my son was maybe 10, 12 years old at the time. You know, one of my students wanted to go to the show. And he goes, oh, come on. I said, no, man, I don't go to shows. You know, I, I really don't like to go. You know, I don't, you know, whatever. It was just my fork. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, good, I'll buy the tickets. We'll go. We'll have a good time. So, so I went. And, you know, it, this is how... The business evolves and people change and you don't even know it, you know. I'm sitting in the stands and my son says, Dad, there's the guys are signing autographs. Can I go over there? And he's 10, mm -hmm. 12 years old. I says, yeah, go ahead, man. So he goes over and he sees Cactus Jack, you know, Mick Foley. And, uh, you know, he's waiting and waiting. And finally he gets up to Mick and, you know, Mick signs his paper. Mick's a hell of a nice guy, you know. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know it at the time, but, uh, you know, my son says to him, he goes, yeah, my dad wrestles. And Mick goes, oh, really? What's your dad's name? And he goes, what's the books? And Mick goes, son of a bitch. He goes, we were partners once. So my son comes running over and I says, I don't know who the hell that is. <laughs> and then it turned out he worked his, you know, he and I put the bulldogs over, the British bulldogs. He was just as black for me, and he was like, he was like a buck 90 at the time. If I'm not the big guy he was now. Yeah. And I never realized, you know, so I went back to say hello. And at the same time, the public enemy was leaning against the fence in the back. It was an old rodeo arena, so, you know. And he calls me, and calling me, and I'm looking at him, and he goes, you son of a bitch, you don't remember me, do you? And it was that Mike Williams. And I mean, when he was zipping zap, he was like maybe a buck 90, 200 pounds. Yeah. You, know, and, you know, he got so big, and he had the long hair, and the grunge look, and you know, and Ted called me over. I said, I didn't recognize either one of them. And then they told me who they are. I said, oh, my God, you know. And it turns out I worked with them, too, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, it's ironic. You, you know, people change, then it's changed, and sometimes you don't even realize it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Amando Clean was uh, Damien Demento. It came to me while we were... Yeah. 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 Wow. <laughs> I always thought I just thought he was great. I, I loved love the spot he would do where he would uh he would like mine then he was like salting someone's head before he'd bite him. Yeah. Right. Just little things like that always stick in my mind then. Sure. I mean Savardi had some tremendous people work for him over the years. I mean, you know, uh Phil Apollo was one of his champions, he was big in the in the England area and then of course Tom Brandy, which uh later he 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 had uh, yeah, Sal Sincere. What's that? He became Salvatore Sincere in, in WWE. Yeah, he was. And then he also did the uh, Patriot gimmick for a while after Gary Wilkes got hurt. Yeah. And I mean, you know, uh, Tom was a, just a green kid when we first started up there. Mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, Mario had some good people come in. I mean, he, uh, you know, Mario had one of those weird off and on relationships with Vince, so Vince never really messed with Mario. 
and I, and I mean, Mario Miller still going to step on each other's toes, you know, mm-hmm. and then allow him to run up there without trying to bury him like he did so many other promotions. So, yeah. But a lot of guys that uh, first came off TV with Vince and they were done with Vince, they would wind up working spot shows or house shows with Big Mario. Mm-hmm. You know, as a matter of fact, I think Bob Backlund had one of his first returns to the ring after he left Vince with Savoldi's, you know. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I got to work up there uh, for Savoldi's. I wound up working uh, when I first went, when I first left Vince and I started working for Mario. I had a run with Ivan Petsky. Uh, you know, I got to work against uh, Red Valentine up there, you know, uh, Ricky Steamboat's little brother, Victor, who was their champion for a while, you know. And, and I mean, uh, you know, we had some good shows. And uh, the other thing was Mario was, was just <laughs> incredibly cheap. <laughs> and he couldn't keep people working, you know. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. But, I mean, I had, I had so much fun working that territory, you know, because we, we got to go all over up there. And, it was really my first shot at getting put over, you know. Mm-hmm. I remember, uh, I'm pretty sure that was there. It was, it was definitely a, a New England <laughs> independent, but there was a tag team, The Undertakers. Yeah. And uh, that's, uh, they sold the rights to their name so they could uh, give Undertaker the name The Undertaker. And yeah. Like, part of the deal was uh, that they had like a short run in WWF. Uh, I think they were like, um, they changed their name, but. They, they just, you know, they had to buy the rights to the name like, uh, the Undertaker. Yeah, I remember them. They were up there when I was. They were uh, one of the tag teams that the, the Tony Rumble, the, the Boston Bad Boy, managed. Mm-hmm. And I mean, uh, yeah, I don't think they ever had a long term gimmick. They just, you know, but they were good guys. And, and I mean, like I said, there were some strange, you know, characters up in that name, you know, that worked through there. Yeah. I mean, you know, Carlos Colon worked up there, uh, Dory Funk Jr. worked up there, so there's some legends that worked up in Slowly Territory. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I mean, Atlas was there. Oh, yeah, uh, I mean, Tony Atlas was a long-time champion for them, because, uh, you know, he stayed up there, and he lived in Maine, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the Florida guys, it was a, you know, one of the Soto brothers, Roberto Soto, worked up there for a long time. And then even even when world class started to fade, you know, Kevin Von Erich came up there and worked. You know, so I mean that was fun. You know, I worked I got to work Kevin up there in Maine. Uh, and one of my other characters, I mean, they had me for my last run up there after I think it was after uh, I don't know, it was just before my you know, I, I don't remember. But I worked as the cannonball with you know, Rusty Brooks, you know, it was uh, I was kind of a mentally, you know, you know, a little mental case, and I'd wind up, you know, my interviews, I'd be like about firecrackers, and I was supposed to be this, you know, this really whacked out character, you know. And I mean, I remember I worked a, a, a tour up there, I worked for Roberto Soto one night, I was uh, Mario's brother, Joe, Jumping Joe Savoldi. Mm-hmm. And then I worked Kevin, and uh, you know, then again, that's again they ran out of money, and I never went back. But you know, it, it, one of my faux pas and one of my really stupid moments, and, and you have them sometimes where you're, I'm talking with Bill Actor, you know, because Bill used to have a little segment on Mario's show, and uh, we're, we're cutting these promos, and it's from the chest up. So I got the firecrackers down at my feet, you know, and I'm lighting them off during the interview, you know. And I'm talking with this really, you know, kind of wrapped up, you know, and so I light one firecracker, and I'm like, oh, this is a bird on Soto, because I just blew his ass up, and, you know, and then I, I did one for Joe Savoldi, and I lit one off, and, and, you know, you're getting into character, and you're not thinking. So I saw the last one off, and I'm still to mention Kevin, you know, I'm working Kevin in Bangor, Maine, you know, at the Bangor Civic Center, one of the big shows, and it's like, and boom, that was another Von Eric bit to dust, and, I went, and all of a sudden, Mario just caught, and I went, what, what did I say? And then it's like, oh, shit, you know, because it was just right after Kevin, I mean, Terry and David Mal passed, and I'm like, oh, my God, you stupid fuck, you know, what did you just say? <laughs> and I mean, Kevin was just sitting there looking at me, and I'm going, Brother, I'm sorry. You know, I, I, I just 
And he said, don't worry about it, man. He goes, I know you were in character. And then he starts laughing, and I'm like, oh, my God, I felt so bad, you know? Mm-hmm. And Mario was telling the director, he goes, don't even cut that. He just burned that goddamn tape. <laughs> so I had to go through the whole set of promos over again. Yeah. <laughs> Now, sometimes you just you get carried away and you say something stupid and then it dawns on you like, oh my God, you know. Now, uh, do you still uh, train wrestlers? Do you still work for uh, the, the Malenko uh, uh, training facility? No, I'm all totally retired. Uh, unfortunately, I've had some, uh, besides being old and uh, dilapidated, uh, I've got some medical issues, so I basically got out of the business completely. Uh, I'm on kidney dialysis and um, diabetes and, you know, had a couple of uh, stents put in the heart, so my active days are doing anything are over. Um, there is a school down here, uh, the coastal, they call it the main event training center that a young man by the name of Pablo Marquez runs. And uh, Pablo had a nice run in WWE. He was Babu. Uh, he was Tiger Singh's manager. Mm-hmm years back and Pablo runs the school and you know once every couple of weeks I'll go up and you know kind of talk and you know show him a few things and try not to put him to sleep but uh, <laughs> I enjoy it I still get to at least go up and be active you know yeah uh, do you still uh, watch uh, current wrestling uh, yeah, I do I mean I, I don't record most of it because you know I'm an old fart and I tend to fall asleep easy <laughs> I'm not going to say that it's boring but and, you know, and, you know I, I like the older stuff better, but, I mean, these guys are phenomenal athletes, and, you know, it's great to see some of the kids. I mean, uh, I've had a little bit of hand in, like, uh, the new team, the Ascension. Uh, I had a little bit of a hand in, both, in breaking in Connor, mm-hmm. uh, Ryan Parmenter, you know, a tremendous kid, and I'm glad to see he finally got a break, you know. And, uh, and I mean, I, I like to you know, I like to watch some of the younger guys just to see what they got. I mean, it, it's it's fun. Yeah. I was just ask, do you have any uh, particular favorites? Um, you know, I mean, I no, 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 it really sticks out. I mean, you know, Daniel Bryan is cool. I mean, I love his character. I mean, I love uh, I love the Dean Ambrose guy. You know, uh, probably yeah. to be Dean, yeah. Well, you know, in Roman Reigns, he's got the opportunity to be big, but I mean, I think he's getting caught up in a little bit of the politics, and you know, I don't know. You know, it's just such a different business nowadays. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I gotta take my hat off to Cena because he, he he's just been a, one of the top guys for a long time, and he's passionate and dedicated. And, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's that's the kind of people you you, you kind of take your hat off to. Yeah, there was some. Um... So I want to say something quick about Cena. Was uh, when we started the interview, and we were talking about Hogan, and we both mentioned, you know, one of the few matches you saw Hogan on TV. And you just see promos and stuff, and uh, I always think that's uh, uh, about Cena today. He's been on top for like twelve years, but you see him wrestling every week. Um, so it, it's kind of uh, it's a lot different than a guy that was in top back in the '80s, where you actually wouldn't barely ever see him wrestle. You'd have to kind of pay to see him wrestle. So, you know, that was, the, that was the thing. I mean, back in the day, in the 80s, in my era, it was all about house show business. Right. And, I mean, the pay-per-views were, and, and closed-circuit TV, of course, was the big and the big new thing. And, I mean, yeah, there was a great, you know, but, but the TVs were all designed to set up house shows. And, and I mean, nowadays, it, the, the house show is secondary business. All they're interested in is pay-per-view and TV ratings. So it's a whole different business. Yeah, and now with the network, it's not even the pay per view. So yeah, exactly. It's changing again. Yeah. I mean, you know, everybody was questioning this and that. And I mean, and the one thing I'll say about Vince McMahon, and and I mean, you you have to take your hat off to the guy, whether you like him or you don't. He's revolutionized wrestling three different times now in the last twenty five years. Mm-hmm. I mean, between the Hogan era, you know, which was a gimmick, a cartoon type, you know, you know, the expansion era, which was like an unbelievably revolutionizing it and changed the way the business was, you know, and then when he was sliding down the scope, so, so to speak, and all of a sudden the attitude era, he revolutionized it again. 
And, you know, now the pay-per-view and the, and the, and the, and the network is, is revolutionized for the third time. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, from a business standpoint, you got to say the guy is a marketing genius. And, and, you know, I mean, I know people don't like him and some hate his guts. Some think the world of him. I mean, you know, I just say that, you know, for, on a business end, you got to say the guy is a genius. And, um, well, um, people here in the chair are asking if uh, your son still wrestles. Uh, not as much as he did. He got himself into a little bit of trouble, so right now he's a guest of the state of Florida. Oh, okay. Uh, he'll be out for another six months, and then I don't know what he's going to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I think he's just trying to get himself back on, you know, on the state and there, and... Uh, uh, he's had a nice little brother there for a while. I mean, he had wound up getting to wrestle... Um, quite a bit, and he, and he wrestled down in Peru on a tour with me, and then he had a nice little set of matches with Billy Kidman and uh, Mike Graham, and you know, so I mean, he got he got his feet wet and got the you know, he had a chance to get booked in Puerto Rico when he was younger, but you know, like for them back then, everything fell apart, and just before he was supposed to start down there, they changed bookers and that kind of changed things, so, but. uh uh, you know, he had his little, his little taste of the sunshine, and, you know, hopefully he'll do it again. If not, I just hope he's, you know, <laughs> becomes a, a better man, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did you ever work uh, Puerto Rico? I did, but briefly. I mean, I wasn't down there very long. I mean, it was one of those in and out. Um, you know, I mean, unfortunately or fortunately, no matter how you look at it, you know, when I went down there, the money wasn't, you know, I didn't. So I didn't stay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you, so you didn't have time to have any run-ins with, with the fans. Because a lot of people who come on here say, uh, uh, some people love Puerto Rico, but a lot of the guys who work here in Puerto Rico didn't really like, uh, you know, getting batteries or uh, or diapers <laughs> thrown at them. So. Well, it was still me you know, out and cups some pits from the balconies, you know. So, I mean, they, some, they, they are passionate about the wrestling down there, you know. And, and I mean, it's, uh, in most of the island nations, they are. The Bahamas was not much different, you know. And, I mean, you know, you work down there, and, and, and island people can be very, very passionate. Well, we want to thank you for coming on tonight. It's been it's been great talking to you. Well, it's my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Very cool. I'd love to have you back sometime. Uh, you call, and I'll be there. No problem at all. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been great. Hi, this is Paul Orndorff. This is wonderful to you. In your head, online.com. That's who I listen to.